Hi, Zev. Thanks for joining me, friend. Hi, Tashin. I'm so excited to finally be here. Yes, it's been a long time coming. Uh, mm -hmm. So, um, for context for folks, Zev and I have been friends and collaborators for quite a while. And uh, in the last few years, a lot of the projects we've worked on have re been related to the love work that we both do with loving kindness meditation and the Brahma Viharas and finding traditional and untraditional ways to spread those in the world. And uh, Zev's also just a really sweet and amazing and uh, impossibly talented person. So it's uh, lovely to have a chance to get to know him better and to share him with the world. Um, so I'll start by asking you, well, wait, hold on. Before we do that, I just, for, for context for everybody else also, mm. Tashin is amazing. Uh, he's an amazing human being. <laughs> uh, I I feel so blessed uh, to have met him and to have gotten to know him over the last several years. Um, uh, there... Hmm. I, there was like a there was a point uh, last year, year and a half ago, or something like that, where I really felt felt like our friendship was one of the most important things in my life, as I was just learning so much from being with you and collaborating with you, and um, yeah, it's been uh, incredible to have gotten to know you in a in a deeper way. Hmm. So I'm really really happy that we're finally able to kind of share share this friendship with the world. Mm. That's really sweet, Zev. Thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is what happens when two love people get together and have a conversation. <laughs> they just love on each other. Uh, so thank you. Mm. You know, I, I think of this as a chance to really see someone and get to know who they are. And I think of it in terms of a metaphor of like painting a picture of someone. Like these days, I'm a visual artist, of course, and I like to draw people, especially the ladies, which we both like the ladies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, it's it's a metaphor of painting a picture of someone and really showing who they are, not just their visual appearance, but who, who, what their soul is and who, who they are and what their qualities are. And a conversation is an excellent medium for that and asking someone questions and getting to know them. So this whole conversation is a space for me to get to know you in a deeper way and really understand you and to share that portrait with the world. And mm -hmm. I really like to start with a frame for that portrait, which is someone's life story. Um, not only the facts of what's happened in their life and where they've been, but really giving them space to hear, to frame how they see it, how they understand what's happened to them, how they make sense of it. And anything's a valid answer to that. You can answer this however you like. Some people answer very briefly. Some people answer in a long way. Some people have, give sort of a factual chronological account. You can feel free to tell an epic tale. Uh, however you choose to do it is fair game, and I'd love to hear it, uh, whatever you'd like to share about your life. Mm. Mm. I'm glad I got a little bit of practice uh, recently with North. Mm. Um, we gave these wayfinding mind talks at Boundless Refuge, and it, it's, it's a... Uh, talk about an hour the life story so i i recently had the opportunity to do one of these so i'm excited about trying again and honing honing in a little more mm. and i'm sure i'm also going to leave something out uh, i i i know i know this about myself as soon as i finish telling it i'm gonna be like oh that was there there's this this thread that was so cool and important or whatever anyway i'll try to start at the beginning and uh, again thanks for allowing me to to be your model uh, it's really helpful for me too to look at my life and um, tell the story connect the dots so i'll start with where i was born my parents were lynn and robert benjamin they uh, they met in high school they were high school sweethearts in uh, philadelphia um, and I grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia. Their parents, I don't believe, were immigrants, but their parents were. And 
uh, so I kind of grew up in this context of of um, like getting ahead being very important, kind of rising up through the social and um, economic socioeconomic hierarchy. I grew up Jewish, I would say really more culturally Jewish than uh, very much practicing. We lit Shabbat candles every Friday and we went to the high holidays. Um, my father was always proud to put on a talus and his fancy kippahs. But it wasn't it wasn't like a everyday part of our life. We didn't, besides lighting candles and having kind of a Shabbat dinner, we didn't really keep Shabbat. It's one of the um, one of the practices in Judaism. In fact, when I was growing up, I, I went to Hebrew school, but partway through, I uh, decided that I didn't believe in this whole God thing and declared myself atheist. And, uh, and from then, then on, I was, I was culturally Jewish. Anyway, we'll get back to that. Uh, education was really important for, um, like for my parents, and I guess they kind of passed that on from, to me. I never had chores growing up. Instead, my parents told me that my my job in the household was to study and do my uh, do my homework. I I found that really difficult, though. It was very hard to keep track of everything I needed to do and um, kind of plan my time. I was I was really much more in the moment and in the moment I would forget about the stuff that was coming up and I had kind of difficulty chopping up the the work into different chunks. So uh, oftentimes my my days would be coming home from school and then wanting to you know take a break so then I would I would read or play computer games or go play with a friend or something until late and then I would start my homework uh, which meant in school I was um uh, tremendously underslept, which was not good for, not good for actually doing um, well in school. But I, it turns out that I, I did quite well anyway. At a pretty young age, I got very interested in computers, in fifth grade in particular. I just started getting, well, I guess before that, we always had computers in the house. My father was a really early adopter of, of personal computers. He was really interested in, in bringing computers to the medical system, the hospitals. And so we had many early computers in our home. And uh, I would also often stay up with my older siblings and my parents playing computer games late into the night, much to the chagrin of my mother. I guess I should mention that my my father was a psychiatrist uh, and my mother was a family therapist. And so we also have this, this theme of emotional intelligence in our house. Um, my mother was always encouraging us, our ch her children, to um, talk about our feelings and what was going on for us. I have three older siblings, uh, an eldest sister and two older brothers. So I was the youngest. There's many ways in which I kind of got parented by my, my older siblings, and they also blazed the trail in terms of activities, in terms of school. Every time I got to a new grade, there'd be some teacher who knew one of my older siblings, and uh, it, um, I guess I'm a little bit embarrassed that it, it, it was really helpful, actually, for me. Um, my, my older siblings were all very good students, and um, so there was also a lot of expectation on me to be a to be a good student as well. We each had our own activity, our own kind of specialty. I and each of us kind of played around with the activity of the elder ones. So my sister was really into acting, and so we all tried acting. I tried acting. My eldest brother was really into chess, and so my two older my my older brother and I both tried chess, <laughs> and uh, my. Uh, 
my other older brother was into running. And so I tried uh, running for just a brief moment <laughs> until I decided that was not for, that was not for me. <laughs> um, but my thing was computers. So I, um, as I mentioned, I always liked computer games. And in fifth grade, my parents enlisted the help of a family friend um, who very generously gave his time to teach me how to program. So I started learning how to program in QBasic and then Visual Basic. And then I started going to computer camps in middle school, started uh, carrying around um, the Linux programming Bible, you know, a big old thick book, <laughs> reading about system calls and network sockets and all that stuff. In eighth grade, we had you know some some reading time, and uh, I was carrying around this reference book. <laughs> um, <laughs> I had tracks actually. In in fourth grade, we also had a reading time, and most people were carrying around, uh, you know, fiction books, and I was carrying around the player's handbook for the second edition of Dungeons uh -huh. and Dragons. Wow. Well, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I started doing uh, programming, starting really learning how computers worked. I uh, there was science. There was this thing called science fair in our near near where we lived. And there were a couple different ones, and it was pretty generous at the time. You could have a a programming project be your science project, and so I did that for uh, I think almost every year. And th these would be my projects. I would learn how to build a network client, a file transfer program. And then I would learn how to build a Beowulf cluster, which is a clustered Linux system. And probably some other things that I'm forgetting at this moment. Hmm. In seventh grade, I seventh or eighth grade, can't remember which, I went to this program called the Center for Talented Youth, which was uh, kind of a summer camp where you go to a college campus and you get to take college-like courses, people uh, taught by professors and uh, people who are in college. And the thing about the Center for Talented Youth is that it's a it's an overnight sleep sleepaway camp on a college campus, and the kids kind of get to experiment with what it's like to to live together. This was really formative for me. It was my first time really away from home, first time spending all my time with people my own age, living with them. I had a really hard time growing up in grade school. Uh, making friends or that's not quite true. I, I had like this small group of friends, but it was difficult for me to, to again, organize my time such that I would be with them or be able to, to play with them. And so this was, this was an opportunity where I was, I was really living with them and I could uh, spend all my time and, and really, really develop. So a couple of interesting things happened here. One was I got this taste for, um, for community living. That was my first real taste. It's also the first time I uh, dyed my hair, dyed my hair green, much to the chagrin of my parents uh, without asking them. I got really into the Rocky Horror Picture Show uh, and uh, cross-dressed and, you know, it was, it was sexy and a little bit, a little bit rebellious. So that that happened in middle school, and it was it was my taste of of this this different kind of of life, different way of life. Throughout high school, uh, things continued. Uh, I I do pretty well despite uh, the my difficulties with studying and doing homework and and all that. I uh, I think that there's there are certain skills that my um, parents 
passed on, which were really helpful for uh, doing well in school. And that served me quite well. I ended up getting into MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, to study computer science, which was really my dream school. And going there, again, it was the same kind of um, uh, magical wonderland of uh, living with people uh, who felt like they, they got me. The, the thing about CTY is there's this, there's this moat. Uh, you have to do well on the, the, I think it's the PSATs in order to get in. And so everyone there has some, some level of um, shared, uh, shared culture around uh, achievement. <laughs> Colloquially, you might say that people there were smart. Um, and MIT was the same way. It just everybody was, was, was brilliant there. You had really the top people in, uh, in every field. Of, of science and math. And that was, it was really thrilling because uh, we also all had the same kinds of, um, the same kinds of uh, strange social deficiencies <laughs> and we're able to, to bond over that. Uh, and that, that's kind of one of the things that brought us together. Hmm. It was this time of crazy projects. Everyone, someone was always working on something incredible. We were all living in this dorm together. We, uh, some, some of us would go out hacking. Um, that's the MIT slang for urban exploration, which was this kind of fun, transgressive, uh, activity that we would do in the late at night. While there, I also had my first, well, let me not my first, uh, one of my early tastes of, of service. I was a member of the Alpha Phi Omega service fraternity. Um, and it also had this quality of, of brotherhood. We had this, it was this uh, fraternity that emphasized service fellowship and leadership. So it was explicitly this kind of leadership development. I also lived on this floor that, uh, the floor was called Black Hole on a, in a dorm called Random Hall. And at the time it was kind of really into, again, this, this like slightly subversive, sexy uh, flavor. We would, during excuse me, during rush when we were trying to recruit people, I remember uh, taking a computer case and network cable and doing bondage to the computer using the network cable. <laughs> it was that kind of place. This this kind of silly, silly thing. We would hold these these events called uh, Bad Hentai Night, where we would watch really bad hentai. Uh, for, for those of you who don't know, hentai is animated porn. So we, we would do this for entertainment and uh, slight titillation, perhaps. <laughs> and, and a lot of people on this floor were, were, were quite experienced with uh, BDSM and kink. And they were, they were really happy to share their knowledge. BDSM, kink, and also polyamory was, was really big. And there was this culture of people helping each other, not only with this kind of um, social development, but also with classes and uh, skills. There were always upperclassmen around or people, even alumni, who were happy to help and um, be mentors. So it was this, this really supportive environment as well. Mm -hmm. Throughout that time, I was I was also really in this this materialist uh, worldview, uh, being in kind of the center of of the materialist and humanist uh, world. Uh, it, it 
you know, we we felt like we were developing technology that was going to improve all of uh, life, improve humanity. And we're really into the scientific explanation for everything. At this time, uh, I was also, um, I didn't do, um, didn't really do any drugs in college. It wasn't, it wasn't my thing. Uh, maybe at the very end, I started uh, getting interested in wine. For my, I remember for my 21st birthday party, I did an ice cream parlor curl because I decided that alcohol was... Alcohol for for those other people who like getting drunk, and that wasn't me. I like I like ice cream. <laughs> so anyway, I graduate, and uh, I was I was doing technology the the whole time. But my my older siblings um, um, encouraged me to try branching out, and in particular that I could probably make a lot of money if I went into finance and used my uh, software engineering skills there. So I decided to give it a try and I moved to Chicago and work for a company called Citadel and I'm uh, building high frequency trading engines for them. It's actually a rotation program. So I go through different business units. I, I do the high frequency group and the stat arb group and um, I can't remember the third group I did, but Anyway, uh, it's really interesting in a lot of ways, um, applying the, those skills, but it's also, uh, it's, it's really hard on me because whenever I go to a party or, you know, meet up with friends and I tell them what they're, what I do for a living, uh, invariably the first question they ask is something like, do you think what you do for a living makes the world a better place? Uh, and I try to talk the party line of how uh, faster transactions lead to more liquidity and that helps people. <laughs> uh, but it always feels like this, um, this justification. And, um, I also, the culture never really jived with me. I, I never, never really got along uh, super well with most of the people. I didn't like how adversarial it was. Um, you know, competition can breed um, more skill and more uh, you know, a better product. But I didn't like having that competition be internal to the company. It felt like the, my coworkers were, were often, I couldn't really talk to my coworkers. And I also felt pretty isolated in Chicago. It didn't help that I was flying to Boston every, every other weekend. Um, so eventually I leave that and I, I go and I, I join a startup that my friends have started. And it's, I, I find it a lot more fun. Around this time, I start going to festivals and I uh, again get this taste of, of this community living. Being in the woods with your friends and uh, you're, you have to like construct your camp, which is like your home, and you're cooking food for each other and you're going out adventuring together at night and you're supporting each other. And there's just something about that environment that really, really calls to me, really, really uh, just felt so good. There, uh, I, I, I continually try throughout this, this time after, after graduating college, except while I was living in, in, um, in Chicago, when I was living alone, I kept on trying to start these group houses to kind of replicate that that feeling that I had tasted all the way back in middle school at CTY, but then strongly tasted in 
in college. And while I was there, there were, there were these alumni houses, people who had graduated and started living in a house together as, as roommates. And I decided I wanted to do that uh, to, to kind of continue that, uh, that way of life. And so I got an even stronger hit of that when I was when I was going to these festivals. I also got my first taste of psychedelics while I was uh, going to these festivals, and that that really changed the way I I saw things. As I mentioned, I was never into it in college. Growing up, it was it was really stigmatized in my family. And what I found was that it was possible to have experiences that were way outside the normal range of experiences that I had been exposed to so far. And it it just really shook me out of this. Um, um, my conception of what what reality was. I think that was it was very valuable uh, later as I started to explore meditation. And also uh, continued exploring sexuality. So anyway, uh, I was working for the startup and we eventually got acquired by another company in San Francisco. Um, namely, it was uh, Dropbox. So I moved to San Francisco and uh, suddenly it was much more pleasant to tell my friends what I did. Uh, I would tell them I worked for Dropbox and the immediate response was, oh, I love your product. Thanks for doing that. And you know, just the, that, that shift was so stark and it was a huge, that was a huge lesson for me that telling people being able to tell people that I, I did something that was virtuous um, had a huge impact on my own happiness. So there I am in San Francisco. And uh, again, I continue this, this uh, habit of, um, of starting group houses. I finally start one in, in, uh, in Glen Park called Gentle Mesa. That was uh, that turned out to be the the one that lasted the longest of at least the last the longest that I was there of all the group houses that I had started, and it it kind of blossoms into this this home base for all kinds of exploration. So my my uh, exploration with psychedelics leads me to. Uh, to weed and weed was uh, really instrumental in pulling me back into the, into the sexual realm. While I was in college, I, I was exposed to a lot of this kink and BDSM and polyamory stuff, but I, I don't think I ever got really very good at it. I went to a lot of kink conferences, uh, fetish fairs and things like that, but I, I had difficulty practicing it. There was some block. And then somehow years later, when I found the right relationship, all of a sudden things kind of clicked into place. And I, I think the substances were, were helpful in bringing me into a, a more playful and exploratory and less inhibited state of mind. So I could actually do some of that exploration. I think I want to uh, be careful to mention that while they were really helpful for me at that time, I don't necessarily think that they're necessary. And they actually also can cause uh, a lot of harm. But, but for me at that time, it was really valuable to have some exploration with, with weed and also alcohol. So 
So Gentle Mesa was also where I got to explore um, uh, throwing events. We threw many parties there, uh, all sorts of parties. While I was dating um, the right partner, and actually I was dating multiple people, exploring polyamory or continuing to explore polyamory. And we started having threesomes, and then foursomes, and then started having orgies, and then started having sex parties. Uh, and so we were doing that. Uh, I was also helping guide uh, psychedelic journeys for people. And we were really creating this, this kind of home that people could come into and feel completely welcomed. We created this culture where uh, friends would sometimes just come over after work and we would just hang out and we would make food together. Uh, we, we made sure to always have a pantry stock so that people could eat whenever they wanted to. And uh, we even hosted parties for friends when they didn't have a place that they felt like they could host their party. We would bring them over to our place, made sure to kind of get the, the cool party equipment. I built this beautiful LED Lotus uh, color changing thing, wood artwork thing with some friends. We got a fire pit and a sauna in our backyard and we had a projector screen. We just kind of like stocked the house with equipment for throwing parties. Sometime at this, during this period, one of my housemates started meditating using the Headspace app and said it was really great. And so I said, all right, I guess I'll give it a try. Uh, and I started doing it in 15 minutes a day. And it seemed pretty good. But um, then one day, one of my housemates went on a meditation retreat and came back and just was raving about it. And I asked him, to tell me all about it. And one of the things he said is, well, what's, what's stopping you from doing that? And thinking about it, I had quit my job several years prior. I was almost entirely focused on building the community. I realized that almost nothing was stopping me. I, I had a part-time job, job at another community called South Park Commons, but I, could, I had the flexibility to tell them that I was going to take some time off. So I decided I would go on a meditation retreat. And um, I looked around at different options, but one of my other housemates had recently gone to the Monastic Academy in Vermont and had come back and said something like, the community there, there's something different about them. There's something that they are doing that we're not doing at Gentle Mesa. Or like, it feels different there somehow. It feels better. And this really intrigued me. I, I love coming from this kind of tech background. I love optimization. <laughs> and so I, I heard this, this, this uh, claim that they had something that we didn't have. Uh, they were doing something that we weren't doing. <laughs> and I, I decided that I wanted to go check that out. So I went... Uh, the mass, it turned out that they were having a two week retreat in like three or four days. Uh, and so I called them up and uh, asked them if I could come. And for some reason, for some reason, they say I can come. Um, <laughs> and so I dive into this two week retreat. Uh, that's actually, that's where I met you. Um, <laughs> you tell me. Uh, oh boy! Oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! Very ominously, <laughs> uh, something like there may be a moment in the middle of the retreat where you feel like running away. Don't run away. <laughs> and lo and behold, sometime in the middle of the retreat, I feel like running away. <laughs> uh, of course. Then it got me thinking, well, why did you tell me that I might feel like running away? <laughs> Very ominous that you would know that. <laughs> mm. Mm. 
anyway, that, that retreat really, really changed my life. Actually completely changed the course of my life. So much, so much came through. I, I just had this sense that reality was really not what I thought it was. Um, that there was, there was something that was, uh, something was wonky. I remember it was, it was very impactful for me that I was getting into these psychedelic states while not taking any psychedelics, while just sitting and uh, being with perception. And that, to me at the time, seemed very, very um, indicative. Um, like if two things are kind of pointing at the world reality being very different than I thought it was, then I kind of gave it more credence. I remember up until this point, I was, I was totally, I was an atheist, I was agnostic, agnostic atheist. I was open that, you know, maybe there's a, some God out there or something, but I don't know what even is this God thing anyway. Uh, and all of a sudden my world is totally rocked. So I decided I, I want to explore more and I sign up for an apprenticeship with the uh, California branch of the Monastic Academy called Oak. I do that, that that following summer. Again, super impactful. Uh, I learn a ton. And um, uh, something something shifts in me. I come back and I start wanting something slightly different in my in my living environment. Things had had been going great for a while, and then things started becoming kind of rocky. Uh, some things started going becoming rocky with my primary partner at the time, and it kind of feels like overnight things really unravel. Uh, of course, it, it's really over the course of several months, but it it feels very sudden to me that things uh, fall apart. Fortunately, that gives me the opportunity to. Um, kind of start fresh and uh, after going on another long retreat at the monastic academy i decided to uh, become a full-time resident at oak hmm. this is also right when covid uh, hits so uh, it was it was a good time to to go into that The training at Oak was was really powerful and impactful for me. A lot of things changed. Um, I remember I, during that time, I reconnected with an old high school friend. And she told me that there was something different in my voice. There was a kind of, of steadiness to it that somehow prior when she had talked to me, there was um, wish I could remember her exact words, but I, my recollection was, it was something like growing up, there was always this kind of note of complaining in my voice or note of, of pushing the world away of not wanting things to be as they were. And there was, there was more of a matter of factness or more of a, uh, equanimity with the way things were in my voice then. My, I had the, the great opportunity, uh, the great privilege to go on a solitary retreat while I was a resident uh, for nine weeks. And that was really transformative for me so much so much came through it really kindled my love of of the natural world i, I mean i'd already loved being in the woods from my days in the festivals 
so I already kind of had this feeling, but in the way that those were kind of more controlled environments during my solitary retreat, I was living alone in a cabin and you just get to see the cycles of life. You get to see the same tree buds every day. You get to see that there's a season for the frogs mating that, you know, the, there's a season for everything. Things, things come and they go and uh, they change. And I really fell in love with being in such close contact with, with nature and for such a long period. I really also on that retreat learned a lot about how much my actions really matter, both to me and to others. When you don't have any, any external stimulus, you, you see all the things that are coming out in your mind and how your own behavior, your own actions create your reality moment to moment. I came out of that retreat quite lost and confused. Uh, for months, I didn't really do very much. I didn't know what I wanted, where to go. Oak had, had gone on hiatus and I wasn't sure whether I would, whether I wanted to be a part of the new version or not. I end up. I did end up going and, and uh, joining it for a little bit. It was kind of trying to be more of a Dharma house at the time. But ultimately, I I decided I really wanted to leave the training. Uh, and I bought a, a camper van that was built out. The name's Old Buttercup, big and yellow. And uh, I decided to do a tour of the United States travel around. My idea was that I wanted to visit my family and friends that I hadn't seen in a long time. And I also wanted to go out into the woods by myself and kind of continue the solitary retreat. But I, uh, I, I did okay, did pretty well on visiting friends and family. It was much harder than I thought to, um, to do retreat by myself. Coming out of that training, I, I had, a, had a really hard time sitting, uh, doing seated, seated meditation. Uh, there, was, there was some pattern in me where I felt really averse to it. So that started this, this long period really of integration, of, of integrating the, the insights from monastic life into uh, my everyday life, the, the life that I had before. I kind of knew that I couldn't go back to the way my life was, but there was part of me that wanted to explore that and, and see. I wanted to, I really wanted to explore psychedelics again. I wanted to explore sexuality again, uh, but I wasn't sure how they jived with the spiritual path. And so I spent two, two and a half years both in my van and then I, uh, I got a house, got a room in a house in, in Berkeley, kind of exploring that, throwing parties and events and, and trying to see how, how these things fit together. Hmm. And then um, things fell apart again, which uh, it turned out that the house I was living in was not really a good fit for the kind of life I wanted to be leading. I really wanted to be leading this the spiritual life. And so I moved out and that opened up the, the possibility of doing another long retreat, which I did this past April, May, and June with North Berm. And before that, I also played with more integration. I did a few events with ISTA, the International School of Temple Arts. Uh, to try to connect the, the, the past sexual exploration with the spiritual path. And that was really impactful for me as well. So here I am now coming out of that long retreat uh, and integrating that time. And, you know, so much, so much came through for me there too. Uh, really just 
I guess where I'm at, I am now is real dedication to the spiritual path. And I'm looking ahead of when can I go on retreat again? Can I go and sit medicine ceremony in the Amazon? Uh, are there more um, shamanic, sexual shamanic trainings that I can go to or, or do? Or how can, I, how can I bring the Dharma into these other worlds? And how can I, how can I be in the world while also continuing my training? I think for a long time I had this view that I had to create the perfect environment for practicing. And now I'm realizing that that's just not the way it works. Uh, and I'm excited to be practicing in contact with the day to day. A beautiful, beautiful tale of your life. I really enjoyed listening to that. Thank you for sharing your heart in that way. I find myself curious, um, if you take the point in time where your roommate told you about Headspace and you were just starting to meditate, uh, you know, you're in the Bay and, you know, kind of immersed in that culture there. And um, I wonder what you would tell that version of Zev at that time about what meditation is and why it would impact you or why it would be the case that it would be a good thing to practice or investigate. And, and, and maybe I'll just add that like in this moment, as I have this conversation with you, I'm like, it is strange that meditation would do things to you. Like, it's not, it's not obvious. It's, it's, mm -hmm. Still not obvious to me. So, um, it's so I'm curious about that. How would you, how would you speak to that? Yeah. Um, I would tell that version of me that meditation leads to the best thing. It, it actually leads to happiness. At the time, I felt really happy in a lot of ways. I was, I was getting a lot of the things that uh, I never dreamed that I would get. I was having uh, the kind of sex that a high school version of me would have had wet dreams about, right? Like would have never, in a, never imagined <laughs> that I would have that kind of sex. And uh, it felt really good to uh, be having those kinds of experiences. And so I think what I would, I was still in that mode of, of trying to optimize, um, optimize my, my happiness or my, my experience. So the, the hook I would use would, just, would be to tell myself that it, this this makes it even better, <laughs> which is which is true, um, but also a little bit misleading in a way, because the spiritual path leads to a a deeper kind of happiness. When you were describing your retreats that first two week retreat and then your first long retreat. And then this long retreat that you just did, uh, you use this phrase multiple times, a lot came through, a lot came through. What does that mean to you? And mm. what did come through? If, if you sort of zoom out over the years of practice that you've done, like what kind of shifts have you seen within yourself through that practice? Mm. 
Yes, it's very hard to describe long I mean, retreat in general or spiritual practice in general. I guess in, in everyday life, most of us are used to a kind of acquisition, kind of acquiring knowledge or acquiring an experience. You go off and you do a thing and, and you, you, you get an experience or you, you, you build a skill or, or something like that. And it's not really the same with spiritual practice. There, there are, of course, of course, many skills and you have many experiences, but that's, it's like not what it's about. It's actually about a kind of inner alchemy that occurs. There, there's sometimes insight that, that comes through, that, that occurs, that, that comes to someone. And sometimes that insight is expressible in words. You're able to explain it to other people. But the words are not the actual insight. The actual insight is something that, that you are, that you live, that it's, it's like some, some different way of being that you're then expressing in the world. So when I say something comes through, I, I mean, it's like uh, this new way of being is coming forth from my body and mind. There was a second part of this question that you're asking about uh, trying to describe some of these, some of this insight. Oh, I'll see if I can. It's funny watching you answer this because I'm in the in the context of you sharing that life story. I'm remembering really vividly meeting you for the first time and uh, the impression I got of you then and impression I have of you now, even even versus a few months ago, you know, before your most recent retreat and um, zooming out a little bit, one of the things I'm interested in right now is how it's possible in perception to kind of really know something about someone in this case, or or yourself or the world or, and and also how hard it is to put into words. And there's something I can really know right now about comparing these two where it's like, yeah, yes, that's Sev, but um, the flavor is different. It's it's like someone cooked the same meal but prepared it differently. And um, yeah, I, that's very vivid for me in this moment. And I'm curious how you'll describe it from the inside. <laughs> yeah, I mean one one way of describing it is vibes. That's, mm. That seems to be a good word that people mm. seem to toss around. Now. <laughs> like the vibes are different. Yeah, it's like meditation like causes a vibe shift. Mm -hmm. Hmm. another way of, of describing it might be confidence which is a weird way of describing it but i think it it is very accurate in a certain way that there was this i had this sense for a lot of my life that i needed to get something that i was incomplete that uh that happiness somehow resided outside of me and it was an experience or a feeling and spiritual practice brings a kind of confidence of not needing the external world a kind of confidence of knowing that i'm okay kind of confidence of knowing where happiness lies or, or the kinds of actions that bring forth happiness So confidence, I think, is another another good way of is a little bit weird way of describing it. I think it comes through in in one's way of being. I, I nowadays when I meet a lot of people, they they tell me that I'm really steady or grounding or or something like that, which uh, it sounds weird for, to hear because it's not necessarily my own experience. But um, I'm, I'm glad it <laughs> glad it's helpful to other people. How else to describe it? It's 
kind of knowing. I would say that one of the the big shifts that came through on this most recent re retreat is this understanding, this knowing about about happiness, and knowing that it, it is not in the polarity of pleasant and unpleasant. For many years, when I was you know, the gentle Mesa years, when I was exploring psychedelics and sexuality, I I was optimizing the pleasant experience, which was great. Um, felt really nice. But there's there was also a way in which I was then becoming dependent on on those things for my happiness. And I now see, I've I've started to see directly how happiness doesn't actually come from avoiding the unpleasant and seeking the pleasant. And in fact, that avoiding and seeking itself causes unhappiness, it causes suffering, which I, I had direct experience with. I would have these amazing pleasure, pleasurable experiences. And then I would hold on to them. I'd want more. Or uh, when things weren't just optimal, I would be in tremendous suffering, despite everything around me being amazing. Because I was, I was holding on to some idea of the way the world could be. So I, I see now that happiness actually resides in this, uh, in this non-suffering, in this avoiding of, not avoiding, in in. <laughs> in taking action that does not lead to suffering. And it's independent of conditions. You can actually be in a, a very unpleasant situation. You can be in pain and you can be completely happy. And this is, this is totally, a, it would have been a foreign, foreign frame for me at the, um, you know, years ago, but I, you know, coming out of retreat now and integrating, I see that uh, the external conditions are varying. And when I approached those external conditions without holding on to them and without pushing them away, then I'm very happy. I'm actually happier than I've probably ever been. I've had I've access to a deeper kind of happiness that's not conditioned. So, so in that way, this these it's talking about things that come through, it's this kind of it can be this kind of knowing. But again, it's not this knowing of of accumulation. It's not this knowing of of personality, because if I if I try to look for where that is in my experience, where does that that knowing reside? I don't know. Hmm. What motivates you to want to go deeper into that? Talked at the end about uh, mm -hmm. wanting to continue your training and learn more of these practices. What's motivating you at this time? The one, it's just better than everything else. <laughs> that's that's the uh, um, that's what I would tell my older self, and there's still part of me that I would tell myself now. That just like it's just, I just I directly see it's better than anything else. Hmm. No amount of money, no amount of 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 sex will ever mount to the kind of happiness that you can have <laughs> via via the spiritual path. Um, and in fact, there are a lot of people who have those things who are quite unhappy. And that leads to the other thing, which is really valuable about spiritual practice, which is that you can be of tremendous benefit to other people. If you are able to touch into that kind of happiness, you can help other people touch into it too. And that means you can 
help a lot of people and you can help a lot of people take ethical action that will be a benefit to, to many other people, many other beings, the plants and the animals, the planet. You know, I, I want to, I want to live a, a beautiful life, a life that is of service to other people, a life that I can look back on at the at my moment of death, my deathbed and, and say, I'm so proud of my life. And as far as I can tell, the way to do that is to continue spiritual practice, because that's how I can really be proud. The You know, another way of looking at it is, is spiritual practice allows you to be with more and more of experience, both the, uh, both the pleasant and the unpleasant, because you're not, you're not holding on to it or pushing it away. And so you're able to go into the depths more people, people who are really suffering in their lives you're able to completely show up for them in a way that most other people can't. When you really do this inner work and you face all your demons, so you're not trying to, to change them. You're not trying to make it better for them. You're just like showing up and, and helping them hold it. I just want to, I just want to amend what I said. Hmm. It, it also, it feels amazing. If it, it's so much fun, hmm. Hmm. you like, you feel like a superhero or like a, you know, a high level fantasy hero or something <laughs> <laughs> when you can like go in there and someone is, is facing something super challenging and you, and you can like be there with them. Uh, it's th it is thrilling. It's, it can be scary, but it's also really thrilling and, and tremendously fun mm. to, to be a benefit to people. It sounds weird. What is your experience of the heart-based practices that we've both cultivated? Been what's that been like for you? Mm. Mm. It's funny. I actually don't think I'm very good at them. <laughs> uh, I I kind of like to sprinkle them in with my other practices, but I I think like a lot of my other spiritual practice, my it's it's pretty messy for me. Some people have you know very clear uh, following the breath practice, and that's what they do, and they they're do it really well. And I get into jhana with high concentration. That's not me. Um, some people um, do metta practice and like they're really with their visualization or their metta phrases or whatever. And, you know, that's also not really me. Um, I do that occasionally. Occasionally, I'm, I, I really stick with, with metta um, or especially self-metta, directing metta to myself. Gratitude for me is really important. It it really opens me up. And um, I also, I really enjoy caring for other people, like expressing my care in the world. But it, it's, it's, I think, maybe harder for me to do that in, in the meditation. It's easier for me to do that in a direct expression of being with someone else or uh, expressing my gratitude or or telling someone how how worthy they are or how much I believe in them or directly helping someone with whatever it is they need those those are more accessible and actually more impactful for me but when i when I do do 
meta practice or heart based practices. Um, I think they are they are also helpful for building the skill and kind of getting resetting my mind state. If I'm in a, a mind state that doesn't have a lot of the loving quality to it, I will turn to love based practices to infuse more of my experience with that. And then I I often use that towards my myself or towards my um, my inner parts to use the IFS language. I think oftentimes my my loving kindness practice is more about loving my experience, loving my uh, emotions that are coming up for me and and being with them. Just trying to think how to put this question. Is it you, spicy? <laughs> oh, there'll be spicy ones. This one is not, oh, good. It's just hard to put into words at this moment for some reason. But um, you, I liked your description of oh, you know, some people have their breath practice and some people have their meta practice, and and I just that left me curious. How would you describe your own practice? What is the practice that is proper to Zev at this time? Mm-hmm. And that's that's a really good point. The the last thing you said at this time, mm-hmm. there, there's so many uh, practices that have been valuable for me at particular points in time. Like I mentioned earlier, really early in my exploration of, of sexuality and psychedelics, weed was really impactful for me. It was really important important part of my practice. And in recent times, it's uh, I found it unhelpful that it creates a kind of clinging in my in my experience that um, I, I don't want to be cultivating. So, um, and that's true of, of spiritual practices as well. Uh, really early, I think I had some of these. Uh, I was doing a lot of noting practice, and, and it was leading to a lot of concentration. And that was really valuable for me at the time. And then I, I think I, I picked up this, this um, belief, I suppose, that there was a right way to practice and that I wasn't practicing correctly. Uh, and that led to a lot of internal violence. And that internal violence, I think, caused that difficulty sitting that I mentioned earlier. And so in, in recent years, I've been instead practicing this much more open, fluid kind of meditation where I'm using the breath as an anchor, but I'm letting thoughts come, um, being with them. And when I have some vivid fantasy, I just let it run until I decide I don't want it to anymore. If I am having a hard time loving myself, I'll do some some metta or, or Brahma Vihara's practice or some gratitude practice. Or if I have some idea of, um, oh, my hands feel really good right now. I'll sometimes just go into that sensation and let that run for a while. And so it's this really this open, fluid, dynamic, let it go, let it be what it is. And, and the important thing is really just to keep on going and keep on practicing. And and not and in particular also not buy into any of the thoughts that are coming and going. Being in the present moment, um, bring my attention to the here and now. If I see the if I see thoughts coming, seeing them as happening now. I was really inspired by uh, North taught the four foundations of mindfulness, and so kind of. There's a lot of fluid switching between the different foundations. Hmm. Curious to ask, like having told your life story just now, how you would characterize some of the themes that you noticed or from another perspective, what the questions are that are motivating your life so far what are the what have you noticed from having shared all that
Well, there's this theme that I already talked about of of optimizing pleasant pleasant and pleasure that seems to have have has found a um, has found an answer, or at least the beginning of an answer, which really goes back to the, a question for from my from when I was very young. Sometime in grade school, I I really remember just having the intention of being happy. That was my life goal. I wanted to be happy. And so one lens through which to view my life is this seeking of happiness and question, questioning what is happiness? Where do I find happiness? And all of these things that I tried, uh, academic achievement, uh, pleasing my parents. I'm pretty sure it's doing high frequency trading and creating exactly. infrastructure for that in Chicago. I think you took some wrong steps there, actually. <laughs> Sorry, you should go back to Chicago, man. <laughs> That's what happiness is. <laughs> That's what happiness is. Very interesting. <laughs> I got it all figured out over here. So good thing you're talking to me. <laughs> you give such a good advice, Dashan. Uh, <laughs> uh, making money, right? Having the most sex, having, you know, the craziest psychedelic experiences. Uh, these, these are all things that I tried. Not having a job, not having a job, <laughs> you know, trying them all. Uh, community, community was another big one. Uh, and, and now coming to this, this answer that, although I have not, uh, I don't feel like I completely answered it. I feel like I've, I've begun to, to see, see the answer. And um, I have confidence that, that it's the right direction. So that's one theme and one way of, um, and one answer that that's been that's coming. Hmm. Another one is how, like what it, like how do you do work? How do you work towards something? And in my younger years, I I really didn't know. Uh, all I knew was that I could sometimes sit down and then one giant push overnight, finish some school assignment, some project. Uh, and I knew that that was not sustainable and that I couldn't do larger projects. And I really stumbled for many, many years, even throughout college, trying to answer this question. And I'm, I'm starting to find an answer to that. There's, there's a way in which being on retreat is a lot like that. There's this, there's this steadiness. I was seeing it even also in monastic life. I was so, I, I had this imagination, this, this image of like a, like a ratcheting gear mechanism that like it, the gear would turn and the, a ratchet would, would move forward and it doesn't turn back. Just felt like every day in, in monastic life, we made a little bit of progress on things. And when I left monastic life, I wasn't able to really reproduce that. But uh, I'm, I'm starting to feel it more coming out of retreat this time that actually it's just, it's just like day by day. It's every next thing after, the, after each other. It's every step after the previous one. It's every breath after breath. You, you like create a... A schedule and you stick to it and you just keep on going and somehow you're able to make progress towards towards larger projects so i don't feel like i have completely answered that yet either but it feels like it come, it's starting to come to come to an answer mm. another question is how do you use these ecstatic tools? The tools of, of sexuality, the tools of, of uh, psychedelics or medicines. How do you use them for living a good life? And I think there's also a opposite end to that. So there's, there's like the heights, the ecstatic heights, but there's also uh, the ecstatic depths. 
and I've, um, I suppose in my life, I, I have not experienced as much of that as, as many other people. Of course, you kind of become used to whatever level, you kind of level set somewhere. And so some things feel really impactful, even if in the grand scheme of things are not, are not that uh, bad compared to other people, the suffering other people experience. But how do you, how do you use these things uh, to walk, to walk the spiritual path? And I'm starting, starting to come to an answer there too. Um, although it's even perhaps even less formed. Oh yeah. Okay. Here's another question, which is, uh, it's like, where, it's like, where does love come from? Yeah. Mm. Yes. And I think when I was very young, the, the answer was, was something like love comes from my mom. And then I was like, maybe love comes from my friends. Maybe love comes from my partners. And then at some point I started hearing about this self-love thing and like, maybe love, maybe love comes from me. Uh, and now there's, there's this other answer that's starting to form, which is none of those things really, but also those things. It's kind of like love is there when you get out of the way and let it come. I'm still, still trying to figure it out, but something more is, is coming through. Beautiful. Do you remember uh, what the context was in your childhood where that question about happiness felt really alive? Do you remember anything about that? I don't really remember the context. Mm -hmm. I remember the suffering that only I think got worse as time went on. When I was sitting alone, I'd come home from school, for example, and I would uh, not be doing my homework. I would be reading a book or playing a computer game. My, my parents worked in the evenings, and so they would They'd be off working and it would just be me and I would be distracting myself from uh, from doing my homework by doing these other things, getting super engrossed. And occasionally I think I would pop out and feel really bad about myself for not doing my homework and uh, respond to that by just getting more engrossed. Or if my parents happened to be popping in because they, they worked in the home office they would sometimes come out for a few minutes between clients and i would quickly pretend to be doing my homework again <laughs> uh, which i got unfortunately good at um, <laughs> um yeah i just something in me knew that it wasn't right or something wasn't right i shouldn't be pretending to do my homework and i shouldn't be distracting myself from doing homework. I wasn't with people and I wasn't doing the thing that I knew I should be doing. So, I, so yeah, I don't remember exactly when that intention came, but it was in this context of, of knowing that something wasn't right with the way I was living. Another theme that was really clear from your story is about community and how meaningful that was to you in middle school to encounter that for the first time and how you kept trying to find or create that. And, um, you know, I visited Gentle Mesa when you were running that and um, over the last few years as well, I know you've been looking for community and 
-hmm. trying to find it or maybe create it. And um, I know you to have, yeah, strong opinions that are maybe uh, earned from experience about what works and what doesn't or what you want or what you don't. And I'd be curious to ask about that, like what you feel like you've learned about community over the years about what you think works and what doesn't work or, or just what you like or what you don't like. Yeah. Boy, there's so much I've learned, learned so many lessons. Some of them the hard way. Mm -hmm. And one, one thing that I've, that's become very apparent to me has been kind of the reasons for forming community or, or the, a lot from, from the, the founders imbue a lot into the community. A lot of their, their personality or their values get, get transmitted into the community. So, <clears throat> I think it's, well, I, I'll say this with a caveat. It's the same caveat that I gave before, which is that different things are beneficial at different times. So when I first started creating community, I went into this with this seeking energy of wanting to be loved by my housemates, wanting, wanting that. And that, that was good from, for where I was at, at the time, but it also created uh, a, a culture that was ultimately unsustainable because it had that kind of seeking energy into it, in it. When I was at Oak and Maple, I, I phrased it as there, instead of wanting love, there was this practicing love that was going on. And that was much better. It was that we were all uh, practicing loving each other. We were all giving as opposed to seeking. So I think you have to be really careful about the energy that you're bringing when you're and you're creating community. Um, but again, it was very val really valuable for me to go into go into it originally seeking love because that that brought me to where I am now, allowed me to learn that lesson. So I think now it's very important for me to be in a community that one is is practicing love together is practicing a kind of uh, relinquishment, not, not a self-sacrificing kind of relinquishment, not a um, giving up everything in favor of someone else, but rather a kind of um, well, I guess I've also learned that, that love comes from uh, an, a, a self-abundance you really have to be abundant within yourself before you can be abundant with others. And so it's it's about being generous with what you have without being overly generous. I think there is such a thing as being overly generous, giving away what you don't have or what you can't afford to give away. But if you're giving away everything that you can give away, then you're going to get, you're going to receive um, a huge bounty. So I think that's one of the things that I mean when I say practicing love together. Another important thing is having, is aiming at something bigger than, than oneself or bigger than any, any of the members, any of the individuals. When you, when you are aiming at something bigger, whether it's the spiritual journey, the path, uh, service in the world, whatever you want to call it, you, it, it like, it resolves the conflicts. It makes it easy. 
because there's there's something bigger than any one person's ego that you can you can turn to and say well that's the most important thing it's not it's not any one any individual's um preferences or feelings and you can and you can see everything as an opportunity to grow i think that's another um another very important aspect seeing everything as an opportunity for growth to become anti-fragile to become stronger to become more uh intimate with each other to see any kind of conflict that arises as a way that we can love each other and become intimate with our um, our shadows or whatever it is that's happening. Intimate with our own minds. Mm. And then I think there's something important about having some sort of of moat. I I. I actually don't think it's good to have something be completely open or completely diverse. You know, diversity of opinion is important, but also I think for small groups, especially it's valuable to have things in common, things that everybody shares. So I think it's important to really choose the people very carefully, make sure that they're going to be able to, to work together. They're going to be able to become a, a strong team together. I think it's it's really valuable for small groups, especially, to have um, a somewhat narrow band of uh, experience along some axis, or or maturity along some axis, or something. That they like enough enough uh, range that there's excitement and they can learn from each other but not so big a gap that people are falling into student teacher relationships. I think you, especially for a small founder group, you really want to be peers as opposed to students and teachers. Unless you want to have a, a teacher in the community, which, uh, you know, that might be good, but it does create a different kind of dynamic. Hmm. What have you learned about looking for people and seeing, feeling if they're a good fit for community you're trying to create? I mean, the community I'm trying to create has a lot of openness and spaciousness, time for connection which um, unfortunately does it is hard for for people who are who are otherwise very involved in some activity you know just it seems to me that that close-knit community just takes a lot of time and effort a lot of time investment uh, I think openness is also really important people who are open to surrendering their preferences for the for the group people who are flexible in general who are willing to to do different things i think having a group practice whatever it is whether it's meditation or circling or prayer or dancing or something having some sort of practice that each person is involved in and maybe preferably but not necessarily that people do together I think is really valuable for working through uh, things that come up in the community. It's really helpful if people have complementary skills, if they're interested in the same kind of thing. It's, it's a little bit tougher if each person has their, their own hobby um, because you know then every day of the week, someone's gonna be out doing some, some different thing. Uh, and if they're not shared and overlapping, it, it, um, that tends to, to scatter the group rather than bring it together. 
Mm. I think people who are willing to go through things, uh, it can be some sort of project together. I personally like to throw events. Um, psychedelic journeys can be really powerful for bringing a group together as well. You know, it's, it's something that you can go through together, but also um, uh, there's often hardship that comes up, something difficult to, difficult to work through. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, and again, I, I personally look for a certain kind of um, certain kind of maturity, certain kind of pureness. You know, someone who I admire, I, I really look up to in some way. Um, and it's great if they look up to me as well, if, if we are you know, looking up to each other, admiring each other in different ways, or even the same way, in the same set of skills. It brings a kind of humility as well. Yeah, it helps if they share values as well. A lot of these things that I've named are, are kind of values. You wrote a document that you published last year that uh, mm -hmm. describes a sort of a manifesto. It's like a narrative manifesto of what you're what you were hoping to create through community. And um, yeah, this is sort of a two part question, but. Mm -hmm how would you characterize that uh, what it is that you're looking for and how has that shifted if at all over the last you know nine months or so a yeah. year i guess yeah yeah i guess first the how i describe it um i think there are different parts one is a kind of of wholeness of being of having a, a whole life a life that includes the personal and the transpersonal and uh, interaction with others social aspects the um like food even right a lot of people actually are not in contact with their food Food is an afterthought, something they just have to do to maintain their body. But I think it's it's quite valuable to be in contact with, with food, for example. Uh, also being in contact with the, the natural world, having trees and wildlife around, I think is incredibly important for getting us out of our heads and seeing the, the wider world, knowing that it's not just us out here on this planet. A, a wholeness that includes different kinds of intimacy, that includes uh, movement and includes um, uh, stillness, that includes uh, the ecstatic of, of sexuality or psychedelics and medicines, but also includes um, uh, silence. So this this sense of wholeness of of all things in their in their time in their cycles. This also includes uh, birth and death, um, having having older people there to guide us, elders, and having children around who are just learning, just coming into the world, being able to to learn and to teach are very important. I think for living a whole life. Yeah, so there's so there's uh, wholeness and cycles. And then there's a kind of intimacy, a togetherness of being with others through uh, through thick and thin, through meals, through activities, a, a regularness to the contact. a 
building life together, building a beautiful life together, living, living and dying in a beautiful way. There's an aspect of sharing in it, but not all the time. I think it's important to also have the, the, the private time, but there's, it's important to share as well, to teach what we've, what we learn by living in community. What other parts are there? There's a kind of uh, inspiration from monastic living in there of having daily rhythms that we're working within that in a weird way kind of free us and allow us to uh, express ourselves even more than we could if we were all independently trying to find our own rhythm. So it includes things like shared meals and um, shared work times and working together on projects. Oh yeah, and it all includes this kind of love underlying this kind of love and being with reality as it is, being with the natural world, having our actions pointed at loving each other and loving, the loving nature, loving other humans, being a part of nature ourselves, kind of seeing our our, our place in in nature. Mm. Mm. I think that describes a lot of it. I would I would encourage people who are uh, who are curious and intrigued to go and read it. It's on my Substack, and maybe we can put a link in the video mm -hmm. description or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was rereading it uh, in preparation for this for this call, and um, a few things struck me. One was uh, how much of it <laughs> still resonated. Mm. I read it and I just felt like, "Damn, <laughs> <laughs> who wrote this thing? <laughs> how do I this go there?" Place? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, that struck me. Um. And another thing that that sh well, I just, while I was, while I was on retreat, one of the things that I, I thought about was, oh, I want to add in more details about the natural world, like the sounds of the various animals, or like the phases of the moon, or whatever. Uh, I don't know if that's actually necessary, but um, what struck me rereading it um, was one that I think actually the main thrust of it, the main ideas, or the main feeling tone is the same. I thought more would have shifted. But the things that have shifted, I think, are the little little things that I see here and there. Mainly, my my understanding has evolved and shifted, and I think I can better express certain things. So, uh, just a quick example, um, I, I I described the the process of waking up and how it's uh, in this in this future world. It's so wonderful. I love it so much, um, which is in contrast to my. Uh, to growing up where I often had a lot of difficulty waking up. Um, and so I write in this, in this vision, uh, there is always something to look forward to. And, and seeing that I, um, I smile because I, I see that that's exactly the kind of thing that actually leads to unhappiness. Uh, that it's not um, looking forward to something. It's being exactly present and grateful for what is here and now that leads to that kind of happiness, the kind of happiness that I was seeking. And it's not looking forward to some future time when I'll be happy. It's, it's bringing forth the happiness in the here and now. So it's those little kinds of things that I, that I saw that I would want to change. And I guess also um, uh, the, the, uh, spoiler alert the the vision has a sex scene um uh i think the the explanation of that can be could be improved when I, while i was writing it i was still feeling a little bit embarrassed about about writing it like am i really going to put this out in the world am i really going to write about having sex to 
to all the people who might want to live with me. Um, but I, I feel more comfortable about it now. And, and I feel like I can speak to the value of it uh, more clearly than I could at the time when I originally wrote it. Hmm. Yeah, so I guess in summary, the, I, I think it's still really good uh, in terms of expressing what I what my heart longs for and the way I would like to practice. Um, but there are these just few details that I think I can, I can express better now. I can, um, that more clearly point to the truth. I hope it comes to pass and I, uh, want to visit it. So, yeah. I hope you do. I think also one of these things that, that has changed and shifted is uh, what I was hoping for actually going on retreat these past several months. Uh, I was hoping to, to let go of some, something that would allow, you know, I spoke to the, uh, the personality or the, the, the mind of the, the founder kind of seeping into the thing. And I kind of had this sense that there was something in my mind that I didn't want in my, in my community uh, or that wouldn't, wouldn't be a benefit or would be detrimental to it. And I think there, there was, there was some letting go that happened. Uh, and one of the things that I, that I see, and I, I mentioned this earlier that uh I used to kind of have this sense that I, I needed to have this community already in order to do the practice. That the, the community was the thing that would, that would let me really dive into the spiritual path. And as I'm seeing it now, that's, that's not true. I can practice right now. I don't need to wait. And so while I'm still aiming at this, at this thing, I also, I don't feel nearly as much in a rush as I did, or I didn't, I don't feel as, um, I don't feel like I'm clinging to it as much. Like I don't need, need, I don't need it to happen right now, or I'm going to run out of time. I still might run out of time. But that's fine. It doesn't mean I can't practice right now. Mm. I think there's also something around the, um, the partnership. Uh, I kind of knew that there was something I was clinging to. Uh, I'm not sure whether it really comes through in the vision, but really seeing the the romantic partnership as as more uh, partnered, something that we're going to build somehow together, which didn't come through in the vision, and I think I would change now somehow showing the the co leadership that that happens in partnership. I think there's also something around uh, children. I, when I wrote the when I wrote the vision, I was unsure whether I wanted to have children or not, and I still feel kind of unsure. But it it feels less pressing to me. It feels like if it if it happens, it will happen. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And I realize now that a lot of my desire for children is really just to teach what I've learned to someone, and it's possible to do that with students, not as opposed to children. And in fact, it's possible to touch many more lives if you're doing it in, uh, in a way where you're teaching people. Hmm. What is it that you've learned over the years about hosting a good party? Mm, hosting a good party. Uh, well, it starts with a good purpose. Um, I really enjoyed, uh, you recommended Priya Parker's The Art of Gathering to me. And By Way of Mary. Bit... No, I'm sorry? By Way of Mary, who's a huge ah, Priya wonderful. Parker fan, yeah. Yes. Uh, I was maybe a little bit reluctant to read it at first, but <laughs> I, because I thought, like, oh, I know how to run a good party. But she just expresses things so well. And um, there are many little tidbits in that book that, that crystallized it for me. So 
Peter Parker says, and I, I wholeheartedly agree, starting with a very clear purpose is super valuable because it, it, it clarifies what do you need to do to prepare for the party? What, uh, what kind of decorations do you do? Who do you invite? What are the activities? It all stems from the purpose of the party. So having, so having a clear purpose is, is really important in the first step. Uh, and the next, having the right people be there. If you're, um, if you're having a sex party and you invite people who don't want to have sex, you might not have a very alive sex party. Um, and similarly in other, in other domains, uh, you want to have the, the people for whom, uh, you know, this is an exciting event. They're really, they're really drawn to it. Hmm. And who, uh, I mean, I think oftentimes what a party is uh, good for or, or like what, it, what makes it um, feel relaxing for the participants is the sense of abundance. We have time, we have food, we have materials, we, you know, whatever it is, uh, there's abundance. It's a, it's a festival. It's like, like the Harvest Festival, something like that. Um, so, so yeah, making sure that uh, it's abundant, it's covering, covering the bases. I always, <laughs> I always have the policy of, of making sure that someone could eat a meal at my party that there was enough food that, that if they if they had forgotten to eat beforehand, that they could show up and they could eat a meal. Mm. And this was uh, because I would often go to a party and then forget to eat beforehand and be kind of, you know, discombobulated or like trying to scrounge for food. And if I was trying to make a meal out of potato chips, it, it often wasn't the best. <laughs> Let's see what else. I think those are the those are some of the essentials. And then when I throw an event, I really like to like dazzle or awe my participants. I want them to be stepping into another world, a world where they can totally forget the mundane, their ordinary life, and be in this. Like I kind of want the party itself to be an altered state where anything is possible, that they're going on an adventure where um, they can, uh, <laughs> it sounds maybe a little bit funny, but I, I, want, I want my participants in my parties to just want to stay and stay and stay. Like I want them to be um, kind of like falling asleep at the end, like, oh, man, I don't want to leave. <laughs> um, that's how I, I can tell that it's been a good party is when people are staying well past the end of the official end time because they just want to keep on going. But they feel so nourished by, by this event um, that the, the outside world feels like scarce by comparison. <laughs> And this often manifests as uh, like tasteful decorations. I like the um, I like my decorations to be to be well done, and the presentation to be top notch. And the um, I like people to eat and drink out of um, uh, uh, you know earthen bowls or glass vessels or you know, non disposable wares. I think it ends. It lends a kind of um, dignity to the party, and a kind of um, connect connectedness again to the to the world. What makes a good sex party in your uh, mind? What when you're planning a sex party in particular? What goes into that? Mm. 
Yeah, actually, and, and this goes back to the to a regular party too. The most mm -hmm. important thing uh, for a sex party in particular, but also for a regular party is, is creating a good container, a container that can really hold people. It's much more important at a sex party, but it's, it's very important at a, at a regular party too. So at a, at a regular party, you might have some sort of, uh, well, it starts with the invitation, right? You're kind of setting the tone, what kind of parties there's going to be. And then you might have um, some activities or so arrange the space in a way that when people come in, they're kind of welcomed in in a certain way. With a sex party in particular, you're doing those two things as well, very important. It's very important that you set the tone well in the in the invitation. Uh, you you make people feel you allow people to feel safe. Um, although safety is, is very interesting because you can't you can't create a safe space. You can create what some people call a brave space, where when there is rupture, there's a good repair mechanism. But you actually can't make it safe for other people. But you can do things to uh, put people at ease. Uh, and I think that's important to do. Allows people to bring more of themselves. It's very important to have a, for a sex party in particular, to have an opening circle, to have some sort of synchronization. To have uh, both open time for exploration, but also like, okay, now we're all going to come together and we're going to create this container. And we're going to set the ground rules. We're going to maybe teach people a few skills. It's very valuable to um, get people on the same page. Having a consent model can be very valuable. Um, a lot of people will say it's mandatory, but I mean, for me, it depends on, on the experience level of the people and, and also the culture. There are some cultures that really value explicit verbal consent. And there are other cultures that really value um, uh, intuition and uh, attunement. And it's, it's kind of weird if people don't know which one to use. And so I think the, the valuable thing is just kind of getting people on the same page of like, this is how we're going to be navigating this together. Unless you already know, unless unless you know this group has been together before and they've built up the rapport to of how to communicate with each other. Some people might get angry at me for that. Um, and then I think there's something really valuable about bringing a uh, wholeheartedness in play. Uh, sex, in my mind, sex is actually, can be quite silly, quite playful. And bringing that uh, really opens people up. It, uh, you know, sex, sex actually has a lot in it. There's, there's so much in there. For, for different people will have different things in it. But for some people, it's about reproduction. And for some people, it's about just getting into their body. For some people, it's about parental stuff, right? Mommy issues, daddy issues, whatever issues, right? Uh, patterning from growing up. For some people, it's just about being naked and playing. Right? There's just, it's just like a return to childhood. And so for the sex parties I run, I want to be welcoming all of that. It's, it's kind of a, a place where we can explore all of those different realms. It's a playground that we can, we can go back and we can, uh, we can really closely examine, but also be free in. We can just, we can kind of let loose in that playground. So having this this tone of of welcoming, uh, and you know, for some people, sex is is actually 
is not any of those things. It's it's something else, right? Especially in the BDSM world, right? It's all it's a lot about um, experiencing the trappedness. Experience, there's like a kind of there can be a kind of horror in it almost, but uh, sexuality is is a way of of permissioning that and going into it and exploring it. Pain and um, bondage and uh, yeah, all these negative negative things right, that we can then transmute through the act of sexuality. Hmm. Hmm. What a beautiful answer. You said this about your community manifesto that, um, you know, you were a little bit nervous about putting sexuality into that and that you feel like you could speak to that more clearly now. Um, and I'm curious about that, how you would describe you know, what sexuality means to you and what's important about it. Um, especially in the context of everything we've talked about and spirituality and this whole life that you want your community to have and the community you're looking forward to have. And um, of course, this is something you and I've talked a lot about, but sexuality isn't necessarily something that is uh, valued or um, heralded in, in some spiritual communities or paths. And so I wonder how you see that now. Mm -hmm. Well, it was really important to me early on. And I think the thing that was important to me uh, in particular was, was the, the permissioning and liberation, just seeing that it was okay that I wanted to be having sex, that I wanted to engage with women in the way I wanted to engage with them. Uh, that I wanted to have all these different kinds of, of sex that I want that I had that all of this stuff came up for me while I was having sex that there there was a devotional part of me and there was also the destroyer part of me and they both wanted to manifest at different times in connection uh, in this energetic flow of, of of sex and so a lot of the early exploration was just kind of this permissioning of all of that One of the things that came through while I was at ISTA was seeing how pleasure is really part of the spiritual journey. There's, there's one way of, of viewing uh, the spiritual path as laid out in Buddhism as a refinement of, of pleasure, that you can find pleasure in, in the body, in sexuality, for example. But then there are also pleasure that's beyond that. And the jhanas are kinds of deeper and deeper kinds of bliss and pleasure. And so as you as you continue to refine that, you can use it as a tool for uh, spiritual insight. And so from that point of view, the sexuality was just the the top of funnel for me. It was it was the foot in the door thing that that led me to seeing that. Oh, it's actually okay to be okay to have pleasure, to feel pleasure in my body. Not to get stuck on it as the goal, but that it was it was part of the path. And so I guess that's how I'm seeing it now. That it is it's part of the path. It's a step along the path, but it is not the end of the path. And it can lead to these mundane um these mundane, uh, this mundane liberation, right? Like the, the purification of shame around sexuality. There's a lot of shame in our, in our culture. But also it can be extraordinarily valuable as I saw to go into it and just try to find the end. Can you find the most pleasurable sexual experience? <laughs> try to find it. Uh, and what you'll find, I suspect you'll find, what I found 
was that while you can find some extraordinarily pleasurable experiences, they do not lead to ultimate liberation. And so you can use it in that way as this, as this proof that, that the pleasure doesn't actually lead to happiness. No, I'm just imagining you crafting a sex party around that, cultivating that particular insight. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Well, you have very generously answered my questions about many topics. I wonder if there's anything you'd like to talk more about or dive more deeply into. Yes. There are a couple of things I wanted to talk about. Mm. I'm I'm curious how how you see the path of love, mm. and what is what what distinguishes the path of love from other spiritual paths. Mm. Oof. Um, you know what comes to me in this moment. And I, I'm sure that I'll frame this differently in a different context, but in the context of this conversation, to some extent, honestly, Zev, I'm just almost like LARPing a spiritual path that I want to practice. Uh, <laughs> and I hadn't quite heard someone talk about the path in a way that, um, yeah, I wanted to give my whole life to. And mm. I think that... Um, at this point, I know that I'm kind of stubborn and I have to learn things for myself in some ways, even if it's by bumping my head against the wall or uh, other parts of my body against the wall. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, I think hmm, for me right now, practicing with the heart and cultivating love in my heart and trying to do that all day long is something that's genuinely motivating for me and something that I have the desire to do all day long and something that I want to return to again and again, day after day, week after week, month after month. And also importantly, something that I see fitting into the whole of my life. You talked about like wholeness and community and living a whole life. And um, I'm so glad that I did monastic training for a time, but that's not how I see my life wanting to be lived at this time it's it's almost like i'm a river that's flowing down a direction and you know i i can't make it turn into a different direction i can't mm. also just become an ocean if i want to or become i don't know a road like i'm i'm just this river that's flowing in this direction and i want to flow with the stream of my life rather than against it and so when i talk about the path of love um for me it's it's really speaking to what I found to be true and something that I want to cultivate for myself and want to share with my friends, want to share with the people of the earth at this time that we find ourselves in. So it's a, it's a timely and a situational path, mm. one that speaks to me and I hope to others. Um, I really treasure the heart and the heart is a continuous mystery to me, something I'm learning more and more about and developing more and more intimate knowledge of and I wanted to frame the path of love in terms of the heart and everything that it can experience and everything that it can know um, which is not exclusively the Brahma Viharas it's not exclusively the Buddhist heart-centered approach it's also other things like I don't know laughter has been a big one for me or or gratitude which you mentioned or uh, forgiveness or these other qualities or even just feeling what emotions are present um and then also things like the mm, you know, I, i've talked about like heart spaces and things like morphic fields or i don't know it really seems to me like the heart can connect to these things and um that's something i'm curious about so i've tried to frame the path of love to include all of that and um not just be about um, loving kindness in particular, for example, or the Brahma Vihara as, as a as a particular structure. Um, 
it's also one that's like playful and uh, expressive and creative and includes art or music or, um, you know, silliness, as you talked about, or, or sexuality or, or dance. And um, I want it to be something that impacts the culture. And that's something we've talked a lot about. And that's, um, I don't know, that's fun. I want it to be fun. Like I want to, that's something I've really come to value. <laughs> I value fun. I want my life to be fun. Um, like, yeah, I want to look back when I die and say, I'm proud of what I've done and it's been a good life and it's been a benefit and all, all of that, of course. But like today, right now that I'm living, I want to have fun too. And um, that doesn't mean I need to just be a hedonist or just um, get pleasure in whatever way at whatever cost or something but I, I really would like to enjoy my life and um even if i'm cultivating the spiritual path or these virtues i want to uh, do it in a way that i actually enjoy and that's life-giving for me and so you know like the meta dance parties for example are just such a good example of this of like i don't have to force myself to go to a meta dance party or to practice in that way it's like literally every time it's just such a joy and um like i'm i'm up to, i'm like created the party i wanted to attend you know and i'm glad that other people also want to be there but even if it was just me and bi or just me and you and bi or something like uh that'd be great you know like i'd still do it and um yeah uh i i think the last thing i'll say about that is um how to put it I know some part of me, as I say, this is like worried that that's sort of backwards or sort of self-centered or something. But like, I, I really have come to believe through my life that by creating the thing that I want to see in the world, that's actually a true and honest and direct path to being of service to others, that it's not separate. And I, I see a need for something that is not being met for me. And so by filling it for myself, I'm also filling it for other people. And, um, you know, the the practice of metta and love are, is so simple, really, honestly, it takes it takes five, 10, 15 minutes to teach. And, you know, yeah, different blocks come up or whatever. But like the basics are, are very simple to describe. And we create a, you know, with the, for example, the metta dance parties, we create a container where um, we just set people up to do it. And it's like, I don't know what's going to happen. But every time people come to us and tell us, oh, this was so beneficial and here's why. And every, pretty much every time, for example, there's someone who says, you know, I hate dancing or I hate parties, but I loved it this time. And I didn't mm -hmm. even need to drink alcohol or do drugs to, to have that experience. And that's weird and cool <laughs> and stuff. Uh, I'm like, that's, if that's not service, then um, what is so, and that, that came from following my heart. Yeah. Following my heart towards where it was telling me to go. So um, that's how I think about it today. Yeah. Hmm. that part at the end it's such a rich answer um that part at the end really speaks to this container hmm. the value of the container and, and somehow putting one's own heart into the container somehow does something to it that like welcomes other people's heart allows them to open and enjoy themselves too somehow mm -hmm. absolutely My second question is related and gave a good segue there. Of what is the role of service? How hmm. does the service play into the path of love? Hmm. Hmm. Well, the way I currently think about it from the perspective of love and the path of love and the heart that what you're practicing is perceptions and you're practicing loving thoughts and ideally pretty soon loving feelings and learning to bring those up more and more. Uh, the baseline at the beginning is like one loving thought a day. And then hopefully as soon as you can start to feel love, then it's like one loving feeling a day. And everybody's got time for that. You know, you can't tell me you don't have time for that. <laughs> you may say, I don't want to do that. That's fine. But like, if you want to do this, it's it, the baseline is very simple and very easy um i recommend first thing in the morning uh-huh yes yes uh yeah so so you have these loving perceptions right loving thoughts or loving feelings and and the the gravity of that the magnetism is that they want to become actions and so 
um, you know, I, I, I've heard you say this a few times where mm -hmm. you've said like, oh, I'm not that loving or something. I, I'm always <laughs> just like, well, bullshit. <laughs> it's like, because I, I know you, you know, like, um, and actually, you know what? I think this is actually a big part of what I want to do with the path of love is like often in the spiritual path in my, in my limited experience that there can be a conception of what something is. And then when you actually mm -hmm. find it for yourself, it's different yes. than what you thought it would be. And so, yeah, I'm sure you're not very good at a, a conception of what it is, but like you have mm -hmm. to find it for yourself. And so, it, I mean, again, I keep coming back to this, but like for me that the bringing meta into dance, nobody told me to do that. They weren't like, oh, you should bring these together or you should shoot lightning beams out of your hands or something uh, like try to pretend like you're in Dragon Ball Z, but with meta, uh, mm -hmm. nobody ever gave me that instruction, but I found that and, um, you know, uh, you are such a loving person and I am a loving person. In fact, I really believe everyone is a loving person that that wants to come out. And so um, service is when those loving thoughts and feelings become action and you, you know, say something kind to someone mm -hmm. or you smile at them or you'd go out of your way to help someone in some way that you feel called to. Um, and, and of course, for me, service is fun. Like that's so important to me. I didn't know that until a few years ago, but um, I always thought it was like self-sacrifice, but when you're really doing it, it's, it's joyful and it's life-giving and um, mm -hmm. it's not separate from fun. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Doing something together in service uh, that helps other people is, is tremendous fun. Mm -hmm. We've 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 That's had a lot of fun that. together doing that. Yeah. <laughs> doing some service projects. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I'm wondering how these things this path of love and service in the world intersects with other traditional paths. <laughs> like the, how is it, is it different? Is it, is it the same? Is it, how does it complement them? Is it just, maybe it's just your, your flavor of expression of the Dharma. Mm. what feels similar and what feels different to you mm. well i really liked your what you just said about how you have to really find how it manifests for yourself i i'm what i'm one of the things i'm finding is that what love means to me is is this kind of permissioning Hmm. is permissioning myself to have all the thoughts and feelings that I'm having. But that's that's the way of, of loving myself. And there are other ways of loving myself too. Sometimes I, I just need like a hand on my heart or I need to tell myself I'm making such good effort. But a lot of the, the love for myself is this permissioning, is just allowing whatever wants to come through to come through. And it doesn't look like um, shooting uh, love beams out of my hands for me. Mm -hmm. It it looks like this this really spacious like yeah great you you're so angry I love that. I've really treasured that in our friendship that you've shown up with that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. You've seen me at my highs and my lows. And uh, in both times, you've really been like, oh, I love that. You know, I, I care about you. I see you. And you are not someone who's made me bad for being in my lows or having a challenge with a specific theme or something. And uh, yeah, and then you've also really celebrated me when I'm having some success or joy or uh, learning or something like that. And um there's a specific flavor there that I've really treasured about how you show up for people and 
uh, are in it with them. Yeah. I think I feel especially able to feel show up with people in their intensity. Mm -hmm. It's something that perhaps I've struggled with in the past is holding my own intensity. And as I become more and more skilled in it, it's a, it's a way I can show up for others and be with them in, in all of their uh, expression, intense expression of emotion. Or, ener or just raw energy sometimes. Sometimes it's just like coming through as the body shaking or as panic or as something else. Mm -hmm. Mm. Is there anything else you'd like to talk more about? Hmm. You mentioned at the very beginning, we both enjoy the girls. <laughs> I'm wondering what it's like for you. What? Um... Yeah, how's it manifest for you, and what what value do you see mm. in that mm. in that love of of women and attraction? Mm. Yeah, I'm coming back to this river metaphor and how I can't turn into the ocean or a road or something. And it's just like I have always loved women, and uh, I think there were times, especially in the monastic training or before it, where I thought about like, oh, maybe celibacy would be good or uh, something and and I don't know when this happened, but it's just like oh, I'm accepting who I am, and I'm not going to be someone that I'm not, and uh, this is just how I'm built. And so, so there's a self love in that of just knowing who, and a self knowledge of, yeah, I'm this man in this human body, and I'm attracted to women, and uh, that's so life giving for me to connect with women, and um, I think. Hmm. On the one hand, like in a very worldly way, I love sexuality and romance. And um, that's, of course, so enlivening for me, uh, as with most people, I think, or a lot of people um, in, in just a very like ordinary way. I don't think that there's something special about that. I have really seen over the years how there's a devotional quality, I'd say. Um, especially in certain relationships or with certain people where, um, yes, there are these elements of romance or sexuality. And that's all, often like the door through which I find this. But then mm -hmm. if I go through the door, I find genuine devotion. And um, I've cultivated over the years a genuine a, a devotional relationship with Guanyin. And it's been important for me to uh, imagine her in a way that I find, you know, sort of compelling attractive uh and that's been really sweet and healing for me and um i mentioned that because uh that's 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 sort of a transcendent symbolic mythological way to connect to divinity and then there's also these incarnated human women who are just so amazing and so magnificent that's the word that keeps coming up for me like magnificent um that when I see these women and connect to them and I feel that devotion, I see that magnificence shining mm -hmm. through their soul. And it's something about wisdom and, uh, and inner beauty and virtue and like ambition or strength that is just, I, I really try to see beautiful qualities in everyone and see what's uh, virtuous or good about each person. I've, I really been able to see that, but then there are some women where yeah, I think it's like resonance where it's like, this particular person and me at this particular moment is just and mm -hmm. where that's taking me i don't always know but i trust it and from this heart it's like um 
I had a tweet earlier this year describing a connection with one of these women. And it was like, my heart is a compass and it's pointing towards you. And mm -hmm. where is that going to go? I don't know. I really don't know. And that's that uncertainty is sometimes painful or challenging or confusing, but I know this is the direction. And I've seen again and again that when I follow my heart, whether it's with women in this case or, or in any way that that leads to the next thing. And, um, it's, it makes it makes life an adventure, and I I love that. I want to be living an adventure. So, yeah, mm. uh, I don't know how you describe it, but that's that's what comes up for me with the ladies this day, today. So much of that actually resonates with me as well. Uh, mm -hmm. The devotional aspect. There, there's something about women that I I'm able. It, it, it just like it brings forth uh, in me this quality of devotion. And it feels so good to be in that, uh, to be in that, um, that worship, and that admiration. Yeah, it's like devotion feels so good. And if the way I can get it is by being with women, well, all right, I guess that's the way to do it. Mm. Um, and that, as you're saying, of course, I, I want to be seeing these positive qualities in everybody. I, I I cultivate that. I work on that. And when it particularly resonates, then double down. You really use that as a as a moment to practice, to find every last thing that I can admire about someone. Mm. For me, whenever I've really given that kind of love and shown up with that kind of love, like it changes the way I love everyone and reminds me how to love everyone and it affects mm. everyone else. And so, uh, it, it, yes, it's sort of connected to one person, but then I learn again how to love everyone else and show up anew. And mm, that's been beautiful to watch again and again. I think there's also, again, something in here about the... As I've as I've said many times already, the, the the ultimate goal is not is not pleasure, but pleasure does do something to the mind that I think is very useful. Uh, it somehow like cancels out some of the unpleasantness, which can cause it to become addictive, but it also uh, somehow a mind that is that is in pleasure seems to be able to let go more easily. Mm. And so I, my sense is that when you're with beautiful scenes or people, whatever it is, uh, that that's a doorway. That's a, that's an opportunity to cultivate uh, the, the deeper kind of relinquishment and um, these other qualities. Mm. Definitely tracks so, in my experience. Yeah. Yeah. So like when, it, when it's, when it's there, great, make full use of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just holding in my heart, like the words you just said, and then the knowledge of my life and what's happening in my life. And like, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, trying anyway. Um, well, uh, Yes, let me figure out how to put this into words. I had a, I had a super strong crush this year. And again, I, I don't know where that's going to go in like reality, as it were. But um, reality, as it were, <laughs> that's an interesting <laughs> phrase. But um, mm, one of the th just one of the things that came out of that was um, an idea for a story. And so I'm I'm writing two novels in parallel right now. And one of them is this idea for a story. And it's really, um, for, for me right now, fiction's one of the most alive things and making stories and writing them and learning how they work and also watching movies or reading novels to understand and sort of train in that. And um, that, in a, in a weird way that I, nobody ever told me, but like, that's my spiritual path right now is like going down into these worlds and these stories and these worlds that um, my heart is called to. And they're, they're not the ones that I would have like chosen up here. Like I'm not writing a really cool 
sci-fi story for example that like my 12 year old self would think is badass or something like i'm not writing the next star wars or something uh it's like i have no idea where these worlds come from or why they're calling me but they are and um th there's a devotion in that actually it's like transmuting into i i don't know why but my my heart is drawing me here so here we go and um i'll have to see where that story takes me but i'm curious to see yeah mm. yeah mm. Yeah, it's really interesting how just life seems to take you somewhere. Uh, it's been a been on my mind recently. Just this, like there are certain conditions of my life. I've had a certain upbringing. I've had certain opportunities, and resisting them or trying to make it something different than it is is not it's not the way. Mm. It's like just working with all of those things and. My life is going to take me somewhere. Um, I'm the, the thing to do is kind of just to go with it and see, as you're saying, where where's my heart lead? Follow that. Show up for every next, every next beat of the heart. That's right. That's right. Uh, I'm really glad you didn't run away. Like that was such a. <laughs> That was such a late 2018 Tashin thing to say, like, oh, you might want to run away halfway through. Like, don't. Like, I, I probably wouldn't get, if I was in that context now, I wouldn't give that advice. But I'm glad I gave you that advice and I'm glad you didn't run away because we probably wouldn't be friends if you had run away. So, amongst other things. So, uh, good job, our past selves. Yeah. Yes. I had such a convoluted, crazy, probably... Probably, I don't know whether it would have worked out, but I, I had this, this scheme in my, in, in my mind. I, I got a list of uh, like three friends that I wanted to call and like get a, a majority of them to agree about whether I should stay or go because uh, I didn't trust myself. And... Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's so funny. That's, uh, that's so, that's so <laughs> optimizers have. <laughs> it's very optimizers have. <laughs> Treating my decision making process as a Byzantine fault tolerance system. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Uh, uh. Well, thank you so much for joining me today and really sharing your heart and bringing your heart and telling me about your life and answering my questions. It's been such a treat and uh I'm I'm so proud to be sharing you with the world in this way. So yeah, mm -hmm. thank you so much, Zev. Well, thank you so much for um asking such uh questions that really draw me out and for answering questions i gave you in um such a rich way for a fun conversation thank you <laughs>